that way. So it's been a great, and uh, let's sing this song together. As we wander through our rebellion, pursued us, met us with affection, of our reaching space and time. We lift our voice to praise you. Go way back and sing, God is so good. And we 
sing, God is so good. God is so good. Yeah, God is so good. He's so good.
Last week we had an amazing Easter Sunday where we just celebrated and we sang and heard stories and this place was packed out. So much passion, so much energy, and now it's almost a question of what now? And now we're in this season looking forward to Pentecost and Jesus told his disciples to wait. The old school word is to tarry, to wait upon him and his leading and looking forward to this promise. And so with this attitude of just being open to the Lord, wanting to hear from him, let's just take a moment to wait on him, to listen to the Lord, and to listen for his voice. We'll just take a moment and be in silence and just recognize that he is God. God, in the space between right now, between Easter and Pentecost, we pray as we continue to wait that you would build up our trust. Pray that you would build up our faith and that you would attune our ear to hear from you so that when you are speaking as our good shepherd, that we will recognize your voice and we will be quick to obey. We pray this for us individually and also together as a church family. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. 
seated and children's grades one through four may be dismissed to their classes. Have a blessed time, y'all. Kids, we hope you have a great time continuing to worship and learn about Jesus. It's a whole gaggle of you this morning. Pretty awesome. All right. Well, good morning, church family. It is good to be with you, Um, whether today is your hundredth time being here, your first time being here, it is good to worship and be with each one of you. We are going to continue in worship together this morning by entering into a time of corporate prayer. This is something we do every week, and I'm going to give words to our prayer. So would you bow your heads and pray with me? Living and eternal God, we bless your name. We come before you this morning with thanksgiving and praise. Throughout all generations, you have given your people visible signs and reminders of your presence with them. We think of the Exodus, how you went ahead of the Israelites in a pillar of cloud to guide them by day and a pillar of fire to give them light by night. We reflect on how you allowed your presence to fill the tabernacle, even though you deserved a palace you used that portable tent to serve as a meeting place with your people. We remember your son, Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. Thank you that though he is fully God, he humbled himself to show us what it looks like to be fully human and to offer us a restored relationship with you. We consider the wildflowers that are popping up around our town, the lilies and the sparrows too, And we are reminded that even as you clothe and care for them, we can trust that you know what we need and will care for us even more. We reflect on the sacraments of baptism and communion that we will witness and partake in today. We thank you that we have these visible signs to remind us of the inward grace of salvation in your ongoing presence with us. Lord, we consider all these reminders of your good, faithful, constant character, and we say, thank you. Thank you for not leaving us on our own. Thank you for pursuing us. And as we bear witness to your character, God, we also want to intercede on behalf of those who desperately need reminders of your goodness and faithfulness. We think of our brothers and sisters in Sudan who are currently plagued by famine and war. Would you provide food, physical comfort, and the ceasing of war in this beloved country? We think of the ongoing political unrest and violence in Haiti. Please spare innocent lives caught in the middle of the turmoil and bring an end to this upheaval. Lord, remember the beloved country of Haiti. We also think of the Ukraine and the months of war that just keep adding up. God, please cause Russia to relent and end this war on Ukraine. Lord, have mercy and remember the beloved country of Ukraine. Lastly, God, we bring the ongoing Israeli-Palestinian conflict before you. We consider the horrific violence and thousands of lives that have been lost, and we ask for your mercy, your justice, and your peace to invade and put an end to this conflict. Lord, have mercy on Israel and Gaza and your beloved people in both territories. God, we also think of those among us in our church family who need reminders and reassurance of your presence with them. We pray for our brothers and sisters who are suffering under the weight of physical ailments, of relational strife, strife, mental health struggles, grief over the loss of a loved one, fear over the loss of a job in countless other broken places. Lord, have mercy and remember your people in their hurting. And lastly, we want to pray for Benji as he comes to teach from your word. This morning, would we hear your voice and see your presence clearly through the pages of scripture? We ask all of these things in the name of the Father, by the Son, and through the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
All right, well, I have two quick announcements for you before we head to our sermon. The first one is this. Praxis is starting back up this Friday, um, and the this is our, men, our church's men's group for young and old. Um, they are going to be going through practicing the way and specifically looking at the spiritual um, practice of Sabbath and how we can apply this ancient ritual um, or observant to our daily lives today. Um, So if you are interested in that, um, or you want to know more, you can talk to James in the back with Zaya, um, or you can email him at james at sbcommunity.org, and he would love to tell you more. Secondly, um, I'm up here, so I'm going to talk to you about youth ministry real quick. Um, There are some really exciting things going on in our youth ministry, Um, both today and in the weeks to come, both at church and at the retreat. You'll see close to 10 of our 5th through 12th graders getting baptized, and that is a testament to the work that the Lord is doing in our students' lives and how they are faithfully responding to that calling on their lives. And so I, I offer that as just a glimpse of one of the many cool, exciting things that God is doing in our 5th through 12th grade ministry, and I want, and want to invite you to consider if you would like to be a part of that ministry. Um, This is the point in the year where my team and I, we start counting our rosters, and we feel like Moses in the book of Numbers when he's like counting the tribes of Israel and the corresponding leaders, and we're like, oh man, we need more leaders. (laughs) Um, Because we just opened up summer camp registration, we have summer youth group on the horizon, Um, we have a lot of really fun things in store, and we need more people um, to help with both short and long-term opportunities, whether it's being a summer camp counselor or helping out on a Wednesday night summer youth group, um, or or long-term small group discipleship in the fall. This is an opportunity for people young and old, whether you're a college student, a young professional, or um, you're retired, there is no specific age and stage we're looking for. We want our, our youth to benefit from people of all ages and stages. Um, So if you are interested in learning more about our youth ministry or would like to get involved, I'll be out on the patio after this, or you can email me at the email up on the screen. But with that, if you would stand and greet one another, um, Benji's going to come up to preach. All right, y'all. I want to invite you to return to your seats. As you make your way back to your seats, we are going to turn our attention to the Word of God here in just a moment. Oh, man. What a good sound that is. I like it. Well, again, good morning. Welcome, Santa Barbara Community Church. It is good to be together. As you already heard, my name is Benji, and I serve as one of the pastors in this church family. I especially want to welcome anyone who may be new or visiting. It is good to be together. Last week, we had a remarkable day together, didn't we? Celebrating Easter, the resurrection of Jesus, responding, and yeah, that's fine. That's, that's an appropriate response to last week. Um, we responded in joyful worship and whoops um, last week. 
Today, we are returning to our series on the wilderness wanderings. We've been focusing attention since January um, on the period of Israel's national history between their dramatic rescue out of slavery in Egypt until the time when they eventually will enter into what is known as the promised land. And today, as you can see from the screen, we are going to be in Numbers chapter 9. So if you have your Bible, please open it there. Numbers is the fourth book of the Bible comes just after Leviticus. Feel free to use that table of contents if that'd be helpful to you. Because let's be honest, Numbers is not a regular destination for many Bible readers. In fact, I looked back through my files and in my 15 years on staff, this is only the second time that I've ever preached a sermon that had Numbers as a primary text. But I wanna say that despite the fact that these are often underutilized pages of our Bibles, We have a passage in front of us today that I believe is as relevant to our time, place, day, and age as any other. So I hope that was a long enough introduction for you to find the book of Numbers. And if so, and if you are able, would you please stand to honor the reading of God's word from Numbers chapter 9. I'm going to be reading from the New International Version translation, beginning in verse 1. The Lord spoke to Moses in the desert of Sinai. In the first month of the second year after they came out of Egypt, he said, have the Israelites celebrate the Passover at the appointed time. Celebrate it at the appointed time, at twilight, on the 14th day of this month, in accordance with all its rules and regulations. So Moses told the Israelites to celebrate the Passover, and they did so in the desert of Sinai at twilight on the 14th day of the first month. The Israelites did everything just as the Lord commanded Moses. But some of them could not celebrate the Passover on that day because they were ceremonially unclean on account of a dead body. So they came to Moses and Aaron that same day and said to Moses, we have become unclean because of a dead body. But why should we be kept from presenting the Lord's offering with the other Israelites at the appointed time? Moses answered them, wait until I find out what the Lord commands concerning you. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites, when any of you or your descendants are unclean because of a dead body or are away on a journey, they are still to celebrate the Lord's Passover, but they are to do it on the 14th day of the second month at twilight. They are to eat the lamb together with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They must not leave any of it till morning or break any of its bones. When they celebrate the Passover, they must follow all the regulations. But if anyone who is ceremonially clean and not on a journey fails to celebrate the Passover, they must be cut off from their people for not presenting the Lord's offering at the appointed time. They will bear the consequences of their sin. A foreigner residing among you is also to celebrate the Lord's Passover in accordance with its rules and regulations. You must have the same regulations for both the foreigner and the native born. On the day the tabernacle, the tent of the covenant law was set up, the cloud covered it. From evening till morning, the cloud above the tabernacle looked like fire. That is how it continued to be. The cloud covered it, and at night it looked like fire. Whenever the cloud lifted from above the tent, the Israelites set out. Wherever the cloud settled, the Israelites encamped. At the Lord's command, the Israelites set out, and at his command, they encamped. As long as the cloud stayed over the tabernacle, they remained in camp. When the cloud remained over the tabernacle a long time, the Israelites obeyed the Lord's order and did not set out. Sometimes the cloud was over the tabernacle only a few days. At the Lord's command, they would encamp. And then at his command, they would set out. Sometimes the cloud stayed only from evening till morning. And when it lifted in the morning, they set out. Whether by day or by night, whenever the cloud lifted, they set out. Whether the cloud stayed over the tabernacle for two days or a month or a year, the Israelites would remain in camp and not set out. But when it lifted, they would set out. At the Lord's command, they encamped. And at the Lord's command, they set out. They obeyed the Lord's order in accordance with his command through Moses. Church, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may have a seat. Well, um, full disclosure, I had multiple conversations this week with people, some of whom have been recipients of advanced theological training, who said something along the lines of, these stories seem oddly paired together. The two parts of this chapter don't seem very related. Why are we studying these at the same time? To which I say, oh, that's my bad. Not because I was in charge of ordering the book of Numbers, I was not, but because I was in charge of writing the home group study for this past week, and I remember telling Mike way back when we were charting out this series that I had a really clear vision for how these two stories fit together. 
which is a vision I apparently failed to pass along very well in the study I wrote. So consider the next few minutes kind of a massive do-over to make up for my not at all coherent home group study. The theme I wish I had communicated really clearly in the home group study is simply, simply this. God's people are marked by dependence on God's leading. God's people are marked by dependence on God's leading. So let's unpack Numbers 9 together, beginning with a leader who's led. Verse 1 makes clear, it has been two years since the people have escaped slavery in Egypt. That's a decently long time. Although next week we will look at an incident that extends their stay for much, much longer. But for the past two years, the people have been following Moses through the wilderness. And though the people haven't always responded well to Moses' leadership, he is the unquestioned leader in their midst. In our passage, that's cemented by the fact that when a problem arises in verse 6, they come to Moses. Would you look at verse 6 again? Some of them could not celebrate the Passover on that day because they were ceremonially unclean on account of a dead body. So they came to Moses and Aaron that same day and said to Moses, we have become unclean because of a dead body. But why should we be kept from presenting the Lord's offering with the other Israelites at the appointed time? To be ceremonially unclean is not a statement of an internal reality. It's more of an external reality for the people of Israel. There were certain things that if you touched or you encountered or you came into contact with would make you ceremonially unclean for a period of time. And that period of time in this instance happened to overlap with the 14th day of the first month, which was the appointed time. You probably heard that phrase over and over the appointed time for celebrating the Passover. And these people come to Moses with their problem because, again, he is the unquestioned leader in their midst. Now, this is not the first time that the people of Israel have come to Moses with something of a lament. But I think we can all recognize that this one hits pretty different than complaints such as, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us out to the desert to die? Those are the kinds of complaints that Moses more often hears and yet this one comes from a different spirit, and Roy Gain helps us see how. He says, it is clear that the impure Israelites have not arranged to be disqualified from Passover so that they can skip it. Rather, they approach Moses and Aaron right away to express frustration that extenuating circumstances beyond their control are preventing them from joining the rest of the people in the privilege of presenting the Lord's offering. Theirs is a refreshing kind of complaint. And I'm sure Moses thought so too. And it's at this point that we get a glimpse into Moses' leadership profile. Presented with a conundrum that has not already explicitly been covered in the law that God has given, Moses answers in verse 8, wait until I find out what the Lord commands concerning you. As we read through the wilderness narratives, so many of Moses' external leadership pressures come through in these stories leading up people who are regularly dissatisfied and even rebellious, guiding the Israelites through hostile kingdoms, inhospitable landscapes, and more. We rarely get access to the internal leadership pressures that Moses faces, yet it's likely the case that the desire to be seen as authoritative and even decisive loomed in his mind as he tried to guide this multitude. And keep in mind, it's been two years that's long enough for a leader to begin to feel like they're truly at the helm. I mean, think about it. We judge a president of the United States by their first 100 days in office. So 700 plus days in office seems like an ample time for a leader to have made their mark and perhaps to begin to believe that they have all that they need, all the need they need for their leadership readily inside of them. But with the words of verse 8, Moses demonstrates something very different. He shows that he's a leader who's led. He says, wait until I find out what the Lord commands concerning you. And in my experience, that is not an easy posture to hold. One of the hardest phrases for me in my own leadership is this three-word confession, I don't know. There's a part of me that holds on to the lie that a true leader always knows, knows the state of their people knows the pertinent information, knows the right answer to the problem, knows the next right thing to do. More than once, I have found my mouth saying, yeah, I know that, or yeah, I knew that, when the reality is I didn't, and I don't, but it feels far too scary to say so. And my own fragile ego aside, 
consider that the leadership ethos of our culture commonly celebrates decisive action that seems to come from gut-level intuition and always makes the right move. Yet here in Numbers, we see that Moses' leadership, at least in this incident, faced with this particular challenge, comes from a place of deep awareness of his own dependence. So he sought out the Lord's wisdom. And in his response to Moses, God reveals his own gracious heart. Now, you may remember that in the story of the Israelites, Passover is instituted in Exodus 12. And then the specifics are spelled out in Leviticus 23. If you need refreshers on either of those, I can't recommend highly enough that you go back and re-listen to Mike's sermon from January 28th or Joanne's from March 4th. If you took the time to re-listen to those sermons and reread Exodus 12 and Leviticus 23, it's very unlikely that you would come away from those experiences thinking, huh, the Passover sounds like a fairly casual, make it up as you go, ad lib kind of thing. It was not. It was very explicitly spelled out. In those passages, God gave very specific instructions about the proper celebration of the Passover. And he promised significant negative consequences for any of his people who failed to commemorate the Passover and to do so properly. So added to all of this is the fact that among the laws about proper worship that God gave to the people through Moses, we read this in Leviticus 7. If anyone who is unclean eats any meat of the fellowship offering belonging to the Lord, they must be cut off from their people. Anyone who touches something unclean, which includes a dead body, whether human uncleanness or an unclean animal or any unclean creature that moves along the ground and then eats any of the meat of the fellowship offering belonging to the Lord must be cut off from their people. So the people in Numbers 9 who had encountered this dead body are stuck. They are stuck between their own uncleanness and the holiness of God. And Moses says, I will ask the Lord But in the narrative space following verse 8, nobody involved could have known what kind of response to expect. Would God hold the line on his protocols, or would he make an accommodation for the people's situation? And the answer is a resounding yes. Would you look at verse 9? Tell the Israelites, when any of you or your descendants are unclean because of a dead body or are away on a journey, they are still to celebrate the Lord's Passover, but they are to do it on the 14th day of the second month at twilight. They are to eat the lamb together with the unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They must not leave any of it till morning or break any of its bones. When they celebrate the Passover, they must follow all the regulations. Notice how this response from the Lord both makes gracious provision and holds to God's protocols. With verse 12, when they celebrate the Passover, they must follow all the regulations. God makes clear this is not a free-for-all. And yet in verse 11, with there to do it on the 14th day of the second month, God graciously makes a way for all. Though the Passover regulations called for the people to celebrate on the 14th day of the first month, here in Numbers 9, God allows for those who are ritually unclean to take the necessary steps for their cleansing, and then one month later to celebrate the Passover. In our home group this week, my friend Patty was relaying a conversation she had with her friend Margaret, in which Margaret said that this response from God isn't something to just take for granted. She said, what do we think would happen in our setting if someone came and said, hey, so turns out I was traveling last week and I missed Sunday, so I was wondering if you would just redo Easter for me since I missed it. Now, we chuckle, because that sounds ridiculous. Yet God here goes to nearly ridiculous lengths to allow people to celebrate, to commemorate, and to observe the Passover. And one easy to overlook aspect of this passage is this. Access to God's gracious heart would have been lost if Moses had simply trusted his gut. Imagine if Moses' leadership hangups were similar to mine. It's not difficult to envision him wanting to be perceived as a leader who knew the right thing to do, always had the right information. So digging from his own track record and his own perspective, standing in front of the people and saying, well, let me see, I would say we. And the problem is that whatever came out of his mouth next would be what came out of his mouth. And it likely would have left the people wondering, well, sure, that's what you say, but what about God? Yet in this instance, Moses knew enough to know that he didn't know enough. So he sought the Lord. 
And because they were following a leader who's led, the people were blessed with greater insight into the gracious heart of God. And in the rest of our passage, we see that Moses' leadership in that moment served as a template for the nation because this passage doesn't only show us a leader who's led, but also a nation in need. The latter portion of this chapter details the interplay between the cloud and the tabernacle. We briefly looked at the tabernacle when we studied Exodus 25 a few weeks back, but that passage dealt more with materials and measurements. In Numbers 9, something entirely different is central to the narrative, and that is the cloud that covered the tabernacle. The key thought of this section begins in verse 17. Would you look at it again? Whenever the cloud lifted from above the tent, the Israelites set out. Wherever the cloud settled, the Israelites encamped. At the Lord's command, the Israelites set out, and at his command, they encamped. That phrase is repeated nearly a humorous number of times in this short passage. At the Lord's command, the Israelites set out, and at his command, they encamped. Now, not surprisingly, this isn't just a report from live Doppler radar on the weather. There is something far more significant happening here. The latter half of the book of Exodus gives extensive instructions for the the material and the assembling of the tabernacle as well as the camp around it. And in the final chapter of Exodus, that setup is complete. And then we read this. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. The cloud served as a visible manifestation of the presence of God in the midst of his people. And with that in mind, what's going on in Numbers 9 begins to make a little more sense. So rather than picturing the people as acting out an ancient Near Eastern version of the movie Twister, Moses and Aaron like storm chasers, it's not what's happening. We see in these verses a people who are totally dependent on the presence and guidance of their God. Throughout the wilderness experience, God has repeatedly led his people into situations that would surface their need. No army to combat Pharaoh, no water to drink, no bread to eat, no map to follow. Over and over again, God's people are forced to stare directly into their own neediness. And that neediness is perhaps as clear in today's passage as any other. God puts the people into a situation in which their movements are dictated by his movements. Road Trip Basics 101, it's wise to plan out your route, always know where you're going, to stay the night on the way to your destination. God puts the entire nation of his people in the exact opposite situation, one in which they had no advanced knowledge of the route, no idea of where they would stay each night, nor, as our story makes clear, how many nights they would stay at any given stop. Why would God lead his people like this? Oddly enough, as I prepped this teaching this week, God didn't run his thinking by me and fill me in on his thought process. But one clear outcome of this pattern seems to be God prying his people's fingers off of the idols of independence, control, and autonomy. God's benevolent rule could never feel benevolent if his people clung to an unhealthy and unrighteous desire for control. So much of the experience of the wilderness seems designed to reinforce a point that may sound familiar. God's people are marked by dependence on God's leading. In revealing their neediness, God invites his people to craft lives of trusting dependence on the only one able to meet and satisfy their needs. Okay, Bible study over. Way back at the beginning of this sermon, I said, we have a passage in front of us today that I believe is as relevant to our time, place, day, and age as any other. And thus far, I've made no attempt to back up that claim. So now that we've covered the them and the then, let's talk about the us and the now. When I was in college at California State University Stanislaus, more commonly known as the Harvard of the Central Valley, (laughs) apologies to UC Davis, I... (laughs) I took an elective class on the history of the American West. As we looked at the ethos of the settlers captured in both the historical record and later storytelling about them, one of the prevailing traits was a deep sense of independence, which is saying something because they already lived in a nation marked by a deep sense of independence. All of this means that as those who live as we do in the historical wake of the American Revolution on the coast of the American West, The air that we breathe is deeply permeated by radical 
independence, which has the potential to keep us from truly experiencing God in ways that can liberate our souls. Counter to our independent age, Numbers 9 issues a call for the people of God at all times to live as dependent disciples. The two teenage boys had become unlikely friends. Though they were both social outsiders in their public high school, they had little else in common. Nonetheless, they somehow found each other, becoming one another's biggest advocates through the inevitable ups and downs that high school life brings. So when a day arrived when one of the boys faced a challenge to his courage, it was, of course, his reliable friend who stood by his side and spoke the enduring words of encouragement. Just listen to your heart. That's what I do. (laughs) Friends, that sounds like freedom, but that is bondage. Biblically speaking, our hearts are the center and the control panel of our lives. And sadly, because we are part of the human family, descended from the man and woman who launched the initial rebellion in the garden, our hearts cannot be trusted to guide us well. The prophet Jeremiah would later write of the contrast between trusting in God and trusting in people. This is what the Lord says, cursed is the one who trusts in man, who draws strength from mere flesh and whose heart turns away from the Lord. That person will be like a bush in the wastelands. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert in a salt land where no one lives. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes, its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Jeremiah paints a desolate picture for those who trust in human wisdom and power, but a picture of flourishing for those whose trust is in the Lord. And here's the plot twist of Jeremiah 17. The final verse of this passage makes clear that this warning is not only about trusting in others, but also about trusting in our own imperfect hearts. Fam, the kind of dependence we see on display in Moses' leadership and the people's attentiveness in Numbers 9 is a challenge to each of us. We live in a culture that in various ways repackages and reiterates Napoleon's advice to Pedro, just listen to your heart. Yet true freedom lies not in listening to our own hearts, but in listening to God's heart. Which leads me to the next challenge, a call for the people of God at all times to live as prayerful people. One of the clearest ways to assess our embrace of our dependence is by looking at our prayer lives. Simply put, independent people are prayerless people. If you believe you've earned all you have, there's no reason to thank God. If you believe that you alone are sufficient for all circumstances, there's no reason to ask God. On the other hand, as Johnny Erickson Tata reminds us, the prerequisite for earnest prayer, the kind of prayer that storms the gates of heaven is neediness. You have to know your need for the Lord Jesus. Do our prayer habits reveal an understanding of our neediness? Are we quick to drop to our figurative or literal knees to express to God our need for his wisdom, his guidance, his intervention, his deliverance? Are we quick to drop to our figurative or literal knees to express to God our gratitude for his movement in response to our need? Back in January, we began this year with a challenge to be a prayerful people in 2024. So here's our Q1 check-in. How's that going for you? Have you found yourself cultivating personal and corporate habits of prayer? Have you found yourself growing in a hunger for the presence and the voice of God? Have you found yourself responding in gratitude to God for the movement of God? Have you kept that resolution to come to Wednesday morning prayer or to pray with that group of friends or to use the drive to work or school to pray. Church, I am a big believer in strategies and habits. I've been working to cultivate some better strategies for more robust habits of prayer in my own life. But none of our strategies and habits will ever matter apart from a conviction of our neediness. Truly prayerful lives grow from a place of deep awareness of our need and our dependence. 
In a few moments, we're going to continue in our worship by taking the Lord's Supper and singing. During this time, we often have prayer teams available on the sides of the stage and in the back, and we will again today. And they would love to pray with you about anything that you brought in here, whether it's a praise to report, it's a challenge you're facing, or anything at all. I also want to encourage us, church, that today could be a great day to demonstrate our dependence by dropping to our literal knees. You could do that at the table. You could do that after you've had the Lord's Supper and come and fill the front. A group of people on their knees suggests an awareness of our need, an awareness of our dependence. Whether you're there to thank God or to beg God on our knees is a posture of dependence. And there's perhaps no greater reminder of our dependence than the meal before us. When we come to the Lord's Supper, we remember that Christ allowed his body to be pierced and his blood to be shed to solve a problem that we couldn't handle through our own resources. The Apostle Paul described it this way for the Christians in early Rome. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. When we were still powerless, there's no illusion of independence there. Church, as we lean in to our neediness and our dependence, we encounter God's grace in fresh ways. So if you are among those who belong to the family of God, by faith in Christ's sacrificial death and his triumphant resurrection from the grave, come to our family meal to admit and demonstrate your dependence and to recommit anew to looking to the Lord for his leading. Let's continue in our worship.
going to invite you, if you're ready to stand, if you're able, would you please join us? Oh, when your heart is ready to break, because you got empty hands and worn out faith. When it feels like prayers have gone to waste, and the promises
Let's just take a moment just to be still again, to know that he has got to trust in him, to trust in his timing and to wait upon him. You may be seated. And we're going to continue our worship through the sacrament of baptism. And that's a special, special thing to end our service with. Yeah, as Ken said, wow, I just want to keep worshiping. That was so powerful. Um, powerful to be in a room full of people declaring their dependence on God and our neediness of him. Um, and the cool thing is that we get to continue to witness that this morning. This is Sayla Blackwell. Can we give it up for Sayla? <laughs> Sayla is dearly loved. She is a freshman at DP, um, a great track athlete, and a fierce social justice advocate, and one of the kindest people you'll ever meet. Um, and today we get to witness Sayla saying yes to the Lord's um, movement in her life. Baptism is a, a recognition of, of God's, Jesus' salvation in our lives. Um, and it, baptism doesn't save us, but it's a, it's a response of obedience to God's call, calling in our lives. In the Gospels, um, before he goes up to heaven, Jesus instructs his disciples to go into all nations and make disciples and to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And here we are today, and Sela is responding to that call on her life. She has said yes to Jesus as her Savior, and she wants to proclaim that and profess that to her faith community, and we get to witness that, which is pretty amazing. Um, as Sela goes into the water today, it is signifying the death of Jesus um, and that she herself is dying to her old self. And just as she is going to be raised up out of the waters, it is a testament to the resurrection that we celebrated last week that Jesus is alive and he lives and he offers us eternal life with him. And Sela gets to participate in that eternal life um, and that love that, that Jesus has for her. So we get to witness something really special this morning. And I can think of no better way to close our, our time out today. Um, and on either side of her are Sela's small group leaders. This is Jacoba and, and Jeff. And these are the faithful women who have been leading um, Sela over the past couple years. So I'm going to pass it off to them. Awesome. Yeah, Sela, what a privilege to um, watch you grow and to walk with you. Um, Sela has an incredible mind and heart. She is so curious about the Lord and um, is so intent on finding his truth. And uh, we're just really grateful to continue to walk with her. So, Sela, I'm going to ask you a couple questions. Do you believe in God, the creator of heaven and earth? Yes. Do you affirm that you are a sinner in the eyes of holy God? Yes. Do you believe that the death of Jesus Christ on the cross is for your sin and for your redemption? Yes. Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior, trusting in his grace and love? Yes. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit as the God who guides you and helps you in your entire life? With God's help, will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? Yes. Putting your whole trust in the grace and love of Jesus Christ, do you desire to be baptized? Oh, it doesn't get any better than that in church life. So good. Let me pray for Sela and for us, and then we'll stand. And uh, Let's stand now, actually. Lord, we pray uh, prayers of thanksgiving that uh, you have opened Sela's eyes to the glory of God in Christ, that she's trusted you. And we want to pray 
your protection over her all the days of her life, that she will trust you, that she will live in dependence on you. We pray that you'd guide her uh, by your Holy Spirit so that she may live a life worthy of, of you and your son. And we pray that same prayer for us. Lord, we need your protection and we need your guidance. We need your help getting our, prying our fingers off the steering wheels of our lives so that we can live holy unto you. And so this week, will you help us? Will you help us in our uh, relationships and in our jobs and our play and the life of our mind and our bodies and all the rest to live in radical trust and dependence upon you for you're worthy of it all. In Jesus' name, amen. I want us to say these words together that we sung at the beginning of the service as a fitting cap to our, our time together. Blessed are those who walk with him, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage with Jesus. They'll see his glory. Blessed are those who die to live, whose joy it is to give it all for Jesus and for his only. O oh, Jesus, all for your glory. So let's do that this week. And as you go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face, his smile towards you and give you peace this week and forevermore. Amen. Have a great week.